we're told to start at 12 or 4. So it might be like a minute too early, um, but I'm happy to start. If Mandela is around, I can't see you. But thanks, Cheryl, for the introduction um, and for the invitation. It's really nice to speak to all of you. This is my first talk um, in this building and in this department. And I hope to share a little bit about the work that uh, we would like to do um, as part of um, the Microbiome Innovation Program at SEMI. So this is the outline of my talk, if the pointer moves. OK, hopefully that's transitioned online and well. I, I will talk about the state of African microbiome research and why we need to urgently expand efforts to study African microbiomes. I'll pre present an overview of the African Microbiome Lab at Stellenbosch University, and then I'll talk about the gut microbiome and present three case studies or programs that we've started quite recently at SU. And when you see this, it means that the talk is over, but I also put this uh, picture because I need to brag about the size of this fish, and I, I'm not going to get many occasions to share it with people. So, but when you see this, it means we are at the end of our talk. Okay. All right. So these are the demographic projections for Africa over the next uh, 100 years or so. What you will see here is that um, every other territory is experiencing a decline in its current population, with the exception of Africa and Latin America, which are projected to have increases in the number of people. We also know that on the African continent, we also have the youngest uh, population, and that presents its own challenges and perhaps some opportunities as well. So what I want to propose uh, in terms of our work on the microbiome is that this actually presents an opportunity, an opportunity to harness the biological diversity that's present in us as Africans, but also an opportunity to harness pot potentially new innovative solutions uh, related to healthcare and in terms of understanding the gut microbiota of African individuals. So there is a very clear knowledge deficit regarding what we know about African microbiomes. Edwin, am I close enough to the mic? Can you hear me? All right. So what is shown on the right um, is just the search term retrieval. When you go on Scorpus, you can see on the top part of this uh, chart that when you type in microbiome, you get well over 100,000 publications. When you restrict this just by adding Africa, uh, this number decreases substantially to just over 500 uh, publications to date. And I don't know why this picture on the side is inverted, but what it's supposed to show you is that the majority of the studies at the bottom um, relate to the gut microbiota of predominantly individuals from Tanzania, uh, the Hatsa population, because they have been used as a model to kind of study what ancient microbiota look like in comparison to populations in North America, especially in the USA. What you can see on the top, on the A uh, part of the chart, is just the retrieved data set on the NCBI. What you can clearly see is the obvious gap uh, in terms of data sets from Africa. We've got very few data sets. Most of these associated, as I said, with host microbiomes. There's very few data sets linked to engineered, environmental, and other microbiome data sets. So given the fact that Africa is biologically diverse in terms of its ecosystems and its people, there is an urgent need to expand efforts to study African microbiomes. So we proposed a roadmap for expanding microbiome research on the African continent. As part of this roadmap, we've called for coordinated research networks 
through the International Society for Microbial Ecology and its ambassador program, we've started putting together ambassadors who study microbiomes across different systems. At the moment, we've got just over 15 countries that are part of this network of ambassadors, and our hope is to expand it to all countries on the African continent. By having this network, it will be the first port of uh, essentially creating a network of researchers which would have uh, that that network would have an interest in studying various aspects of microbiomes including gut microbiomes on the african continent as part of this network we've called for policy interventions and we're in the process now of writing a publication that essentially lays out a framework for how microbiome research should be conducted equitably uh, on the continent so that we both use the resources that are available, potentially also from the global north, but that this research is undertaken in such a way that it's led by Africans on the African continent. We've called for harnessing uh, infrastructure around the continent. And part of this is that there are a lot of genomic sequences that have you know, been placed on the continent through the COVID pandemic. These need to be repurposed. And part of it is that it creates an opportunity to have a network for ongoing microbiome-based genomic surveillance throughout the African continent. And what we called for is the establishment of potentially four different hubs throughout the continent that would focus exclusively on microbiome research. So we've outlined some of these ideas in a review that we published uh, last year. Um, and there are, you know, since then, like ongoing net, uh, efforts to expand these networks. And if uh, anyone online or in this room is interested in joining this network, we would be quite interested in working with you towards expanding microbiome research. One of the activities that we've called for is, as, uh, you know, we've, we will be hosting in August the largest microbiome meeting in Cape Town. And this is the International Symposium on Microbial Ecology. We've just got well over 1,800 abstracts in various sessions. So this will be a large conference. And we're hoping that um, rather than having less than 5% of participants from Africa, we'll increase that number at least to double um, in terms of African participation. We're also working with partners, as I mentioned, um, to develop uh, various policy frameworks, including how to undertake equitable collaboration on the continent. So what are the reasons for this? So there are five key reasons why African microbiome matter. The first is that Africa is a biodiversity hotspot not only in terms of its natural biodiversity, we've got environments that span from desert ecosystems to more mesic ecosystems. All of these environments are quite biologically diverse and in turn host a number, uh, several million fold of microbial communities that are as yet undiscovered and un, uh, unappreciated. It's important to study African microbiomes because it's got implications on ecosystem health, um, which is underpinned by the microbiome. Understanding host associated microbiomes, for instance, linked to agricultural systems is important for efforts to expand uh, agricultural productivity, increasing sustenance from scarce resources in terms of the agricultural lands. So microbiomes are also crucial in terms of understanding the impacts of human health and disease. And I'll talk a little bit about our studies related to this in this talk. Microbiomes are also important in terms of um, sustainable development and innovation. Rather than repeating some of the mistakes that have been done in the global, in the global north, by harnessing microbiota, we have a potential of using uh, traits that microbes are able to provide, for instance, linked to sustainable agriculture and CO2 sequestration in order to expand and develop, but do it in a way that does not necessarily harm the ecosystems around us. Microbes are, of course, important uh, for understanding the impacts of climate and the environmental resilience. Ocean microbes sequester over 40% of carbon dioxide, and it's important to study microbial communities in these environments to also understand the potential feedback roles on ecosystem services. 
So as the African Microbiome Lab, we've got several different thematic areas. The first is that we have a strong focus on African microbiome discovery and innovation. As part of this program, and I've just discovered my timer is not going, but uh, so if anyone, uh, uh, Edwin, you're kind enough to let me know if I'm going over time, just at the half uh, o'clock mark, just let me know. We've got several different programs um, that are focused on African microbiome discovery and innovation. The first aims to look at the dynamics of African microbiomes. The second aims to look at climate change and its effects on African microbiomes. The third aims to establish a program that focuses on microbiome environmental surveillance, looking at different systems, including wastewater treatment plants across the African continent. The fourth program um, aims to focus on microbiomes and health, and I'll speak a little bit about that. In the next five years, what we see is expanding a portfolio of research that spans across both applied and fundamental research in order to improve the uh, or reduce the knowledge deficit related to understanding African microbiomes. So we focus quite a bit uh, in the past few years on the gut microbiota. And there are several reasons for this. The first is that Africa, uh, 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 um, microbial communities in the gut or microbial communities around us are numerically abundant and consequential travelers for us. They help us digest important metabolites that our bodies cannot break down, and they're important for providing ecosystem services to our bodies that our bodies cannot. Just by the numbers, you can see the importance in terms of the scale of microbial communities. Estimates suggest that the genes in our microbiomes outnumber us 100 to 1. 95% of these microbes are in the GI tract, right, where they carry out important ecosystem services. And that, um, you know, roughly 2.5 kilograms of gut, of gut microbiota constitute our final weight. So just in terms of all of these numbers, without going into detail, you can see the impact and potentially the consequence of microbial communities that are our fellow travelers. These microbial communities are also important because they interact, uh, the microbiome and its metabolites interacts with the immune system, newer, a newer endocrine system, and also the digestive system. There's now a body of research that, that has shown the importance of microbial communities in terms of the health outcomes that are associated. And I'll give you an example of one of these studies here. So the, 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 in this paper, it outlines some of the gut uh, the, and, and shows results showing that the gut microbiota targeted diets have the impact of modulating human immune status. Diet intervention with system uh, profiling showed that the, there are clear links between diet, the microbiome, and what's termed the, the immune axis. There's also a growing body of evidence uh, that's shown that high fiber diet changes in the microbiome have been shown to elicit personalized immune responses. There's also evidence that fermented diets increase the, the microbiome diversity and that this increased diversity provides a much more resilient ecosystem that's able to withstand uh, diseases and uh, other markers of inflammation. So the microbiome and its metabolites are also important because they interact and, uh, uh, and with and produce key metabolites that are present within our guts. Uh, what's highlighted here is short chain fatty acids, and there are a number of these, including acetate, um, that are linked to several functions that are immune to, that, that are linked to immune systems, including T cells and B cells. And all of these uh, markers are important when you consider the type of disease burden that's present throughout the African continent. By understanding the relationship and link between the gut microbiota and its metabolite, we can is start to harness potential therapeutic targets that might be linked to uh, harnessing these gut microbiota. So the gut microbiome has also uh, uh, been shown to play a key role in unhealthy microbiome uh, um, in, in, in unhealthy microbiome uh, and has been linked to both physical and mental disorders. 
in this study, which has been which was conducted uh, in over ten thousand participants in the Netherlands, um, they they took a bunch of uh, different measures, ran some correlations with different uh, gut microbiota, and could clearly show that several microbial communities that's shown on the left of the chart on the uh, on the right side of uh, of you, um, and its clear links whether as positive or negative interactions with several diseases. So for this, um, the, the authors showed, for instance, that several uh, streptococcus uh, uh, species have positive interactions or are positively associated with the development of uh, atopic dermatitis, for instance. So there are clear links between the presence of several gut microbiota and uh, um, adverse health outcomes that are reported within these individuals. But what you will see from the study and several others is that often the studies focus on populations in the global north and very little is known regarding the precise interactions between gut microbiota and African individuals. So there's a potential as well um, for developing healthy gut microbiota derived therapeutics, as I've mentioned previously. So the table here shows, for instance, that the diets of us as Africans um, may contain a disproportionately higher a number of um, fermented diets. For instance, we rely on eating diets that are rich in fermented foods. Uh, Amasi and Maheu is a staple diet in South Africa and other uh, parts of uh, uh, the continent. And this selects for unique microbiota within our gut. These microbiota may also um, consequently uh, have uh, unique metabolites that may be associated with these microbes. So harnessing the diverse gut microbiota of, of African individuals may actually reveal novel therapeutic targets that may be harnessed for therapeutic targets across different individuals either as probiotics, prebiotics, or antibiotics as well. So our group has three major questions that we're focused on. The first, we want to understand how do gut microbiomes of healthy individuals in urban and rural locations in South Africa differ? And what are the consequences of these differences in terms of understanding the functional implications? The second question we focus on is what are the specific mechanisms which underlie the influence of gut microbiota on growth and development of HIV exposed individuals, given the importance of, a, of, of this uh, uh, virus uh, across the continent, and how this can uh, how this knowledge can inform uh, potential interventions that may improve the health outcomes. The third question we focus on is to what extent does housing quality influence the composition and function of gut microbiota, and how does this relationship in turn contribute to the growth stunting in South African children? So these three questions, um, especially the second two, are programs that we've started working on uh, since moving to SU, and we hope uh, to grow this into big uh, uh, collaborative activities with our partners as well. So our work typically uses uh, two main approaches. We use a combination of amplicon-based uh, metagenomic analysis and shotgun-based metagenomic analysis. With amplicon, we normally study the structure and, and composition of microbial communities and the systems that we look at, in this case, the gut. Uh, and with shotgun analysis, uh, we use these approaches typically to answer the um, the 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 function related questions related to gut microbiome. By looking at amplicons, we can we can get an, a good overview in terms of the composition of gut uh, fauna and their structural differences in different individuals. Uh, and by looking at shotgun analysis, we can uh, we can start to target specific questions that are looking at differences in metabolic function in these individuals. So in the first case study, um, we undertook a study which essentially tried to look at the relationship or the differences between the gut microbiota of healthy South Africans in urban and rural locations um, and how and what the implications are of these functional differences. 
So there are previous studies that have shown, for instance, that uh, using short and long read metagenomics, that urban and rural South African populations um, have uh, distinct uh, composition and texture in their gut microbiome. What is also important from the studies that have been done in South Africa is that they, they seem to present some evidence that shows us that the gut microbiome of these South Africans does not necessarily conform to the westernized dash non-Western axis um, and, and contains a high diversity of as yet undescribed microbial uh, taxa. The studies also show that there are clear differences uh, in diet and that these differences in diet um, um, are specific uh, in terms of the specific geographic localities that have been studied. And one of the, the consequence of uh, or the key implications of such studies is that they show us that irrespective of the system that you've looked at, it's important to look at more diverse populations in order to gain more clear mechanistic insights regarding the differences of gut microbiota in these regions. So as part of this study, the first study, we looked at individuals that uh, were, were um, uh, uh, live in the Bemba district in Bemba, and also uh, as part of our urban population, we looked at people in Pretoria. We studied the gut uh, microbiota, the gut fungi, and the gut microbiota, uh, bacterial differences in these individuals. The studies on the uh, microbiota have been published, and I won't talk about this study, uh, but I will present some of the results from the 16S, the bacterial and archaeal uh, diversity surveys, and some of the shotgun metagenomic studies that we've uh, uncovered from these locations. So what did we find? When you look at the structural patterns of bacterial communities, which is shown on, I don't know if you can see this, no, you can't. Um, on the NMDS ordination plot that's on this, this part, is that when you look at the differences in each of those dots, which negates to which relates to different samples, you cannot really key, see clear differences between the structural patterns of urban and rural locations. But when you start to uh, select um, maybe on the basis of the top 10 phyla and keystone taxa, um, which is shown in red uh, and blue for the urban and rural locations, you can see that uh, some bacteria play disproportionately important roles in urban and rural localities. There's a number that we found at least five different bacteria that seem to be important in uh, urban populations and 10 more that were important exclusively for rural populations. The bottom uh, plot uh, shows the differences in alpha diversity. Alpha diversity just records the number of species across the locations. And what you can see is that when you look at the abundances of different bacterial phyla, there are clear differences in terms of the absolute numbers of certain taxa within urban and rural locations. So what we wanted to understand is what, what do these differences translate to? So for that, we did um, uh, we did some network uh, uh, um, network analysis. Network analysis essentially looks at correlations or interactions between different gut fauna. And what I'll, I'll bring you example to is that the individuals on the right, what you can see here, is that there are a lot more interactions between gut uh, fauna in rural individuals compared to urban individuals. The interactions in urban individuals are a lot more sporadic. What does this imply? There's a lot more cooperativity in rural cohorts, and that means that the gut, their gut function is much more able to withstand uh, the impact of pathogens that may arrive because there's a lot more cooperativity in those gut fauna. Uh, compared to urban populations where the interactions are a lot more sporadic and there is less interaction within uh, those microbial communities. So we then did short gun metagenomic analysis. Um, as you remember, short gun metagenomic analysis allows you to reconstruct bacterial communities uh, in these populations. We were able to reconstruct over 380 diverse genomes from these populations. 
you don't have to look at the absolute numbers, but I'll bring you an example to some of the differences, for instance, in the Deucomicrobia and the spirochetes um, that we showed. For instance, this phyla, uh, in, which was found in rural populations, is known to be implicated or associated with people that have Lyme disease. So that indicates a disease status in individuals uh, in rural communities. And this is quite expected because Lyme disease is quite prevalent in the Limpopo province. The leukomycobia, which were exclusively uh, reconstructed from urban populations, are also implicated in uh, disease manifestation, and those are quite dominant um, in the uh, genomic sequence data that we recovered from the urban populations. So we then tried to um, ask questions related to what are the implications of these functional differences. And for this, we looked at genes that are implicated in antimicrobial resistance. So this uh, phylogenetic tree essentially shows you all of the taxa that harbored antimicrobial resistance. What you can see from this is that there's a lot more taxa in urban populations that harbor ARGs, antimicrobial resistance genes, compared to rural populations, right? So if you take the, 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 the fact that these microbes harbor antimicrobial resistance, that's some indication of a dysbiosis or unstable state within the gut microbiota of these individuals. So overall, a picture emerges that when you look at the rural populations, that uh, based on the metadata that we recovered from them, rely more on diets that are rich in fiber compared to the, the urban populations, which rely more on, on, on diets that, uh, you know, include, for instance, uh, a lot of fast food reliance. You can see that this also equates to an unhealthy state within their gut microbiota. And I won't talk about the results at the bottom, but you can see several um, uh, uh, putative resistance mechanisms. Um, and all of these, again, are much more abundant in urban populations compared to rural populations. So just as a summary, um, as the first part of this case study, um, urban and rural populations seem to harbor mostly similar gut microbiota. Uh, but when you look at the gut microbiota in urban uh, populations, it's a lot more unstable compared to rural populations, where there is a lot more syntrophy in terms of the interactions between the gut microbiota, translating to a lot more healthy uh, state within the gut microbiomes. So in the case, second case study, we wanted to understand what are the specific mechanisms that underlie the influence of gut microbiota in the growth and development of HIV-exposed infants uh, and how this knowledge can inform uh, targeted interventions to improve the health outcomes. So hopefully, Frank, you're interested in this part as uh, you've dabbled in HIV, some might say. Um, in this study, we um, took samples from uh, stool samples from infants uh, in the first 10 weeks of their lives. Um, we extracted DNA um, and did some sequencing, both using shotgun approaches to study compositional uh, and structural differences, and also did PEC bio uh, sequencing uh, to analyze the, 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 the functional signatures. The PEC bio sequencing in this case, what we wanted to do is see whether, because we predict there might not be differences in the key uh, phyla that are present within these microbiomes, but there might be uh, epigenetic differences that might be found. Uh, and we use PEC bio, which, which didn't quite work out, but I'll give you some of those results. So what are the key results we found. So when we compared HIV positive and HIV negative uh, mothers, we found no significant differences in the diversity. However, HIV positive mothers um, had uh, decreased alpha diversity. So the number of bacteria within these individuals were much lower. Again, if we take a trend from the last study, um, lower diversity typically uh, equates to in decreased stability and resilience within the gut microbiome of these individuals. So HIV negative mothers also showed a higher abundance of bifidobacterium, um, which were present in these individuals. 
We also found, uh, for instance, that higher levels of varicomicrobia um, were present in HIV um, uh, positive mothers in these individuals. And we also showed that uh, this uh, HIV positive mothers had a unique presence of uh, certain taxa which were present. So what are the implications of the findings of these uh, differences in the relative abundance of certain taxa? So depending on which uh, microbe is present, for instance, varicomicrobia. So these are these tend to be uh, linked to the uh, use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Again, that indicates a healthy, a, 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 an unhealthy state in the gut microbiome of these individuals. So. All right, and when we try to look at HIV exposed but unaf unaffected uh, and HIV unexposed and unaffected individuals, we also showed no, we found no significant differences in the diversity of these individuals. However, HIV um, exposed but uninfected individuals uh, also had lower alpha diversity, again, um, equating to a lower stability ecosystem within the gut fauna. So we also, um, from this data, Try to see what the implications are in terms of the functional differences. So we used PEG biosequencing, um, and what we were able to see is that we found higher proportions of acetate and succinate in HIV exposed but uninfected infants. And these were accompanied also when we reconstructed the genomes, which I'm not going to share on this talk, a higher prevalence of uh, several key bacteria that were present. For instance, Prevotella was present in much higher abundances, and Prevotella is typically associated with HIV-positive uh, individuals. So when we looked at the mothers, for instance, they had a, re a reduced abundance of, uh, of certain short-chain fatty acids within the gut fauna. And the redu this reduced abundance of short-chain fatty acids, which are important for metabolic uh, processes within the gut, may indicate that the individuals have got a reduced uh, capacity to break down certain metabolites within their gut. Um, obviously, if you are finding uh, uh, increased um, numbers of short-chain fatty acids in the stool, it might uh, by implication mean that these are not sufficiently being utilized within the gut uh, fauna of these individuals. Equally, we found higher proportions of butyrate in HIV unexposed individuals, and these were also accompanied by increased abundances of, of, of two uh, bacterial phyla, including Bifidobacterium and, uh, and fecal bacterium, which are known butyrate producers um, within the gut. There was also evidence of anti-inflammatory properties um, that are known to also contribute to the in reinforcement of the intestinal um, uh, barrier within the gut microbiome uh, that were present in HIV unexposed, um, HIV, uh, H -H -U -U, um, HIV unexposed um, individuals or infants, yeah, so. And also the increased proportion of butyrate, for instance, that are found in these individuals has been shown in previous studies to correlate uh, with uh, increased uh, capacity to promote regulatory T cell uh, differentiation within the gut microbiomes of these uh, individuals. So as a summary of this study, which is also an ongoing uh, study uh, where we are hoping to expand um, uh, as part of this trial, which is started in Pretoria, um, the numbers of individuals to try and understand the impact of the gut microbiota and its, and its role in leading to growth stunting in HIV exposed but uninfected individuals uh, throughout the country. And one key result that I'll mention, I won't go through all of them, is that uh, a key finding is that there's a potential influence um, of the gut fauna in chronic inflammation. Um, and this we can see by the signatures of Prevotella that are rich um, in, in, the, in some of these individuals. And, and this uh, increased uh, proportion of Prevotella can lead to exacerbated um, uh, 
problems associated um, with lack of development within these uh, individuals. So in the last study, uh, which is also a study that we initiated uh, recently with collaborators, we wanted we want to uh, initiate um, efforts to understand how individuals who move from informal housing to formalized housing, what impact that has on their overall health status. So as part of this large study, which is started by colleagues in economics, they are taking a range of different measures, including air quality, um, uh, toxicology measurements in the informal areas and in the formal uh, housing. And the overall aim of the study is to see whether you can quantify the effect of moving from an informal house to a formal housing. As a proxy for health, we joined the study and started looking at whether the microbiome or the gut microbiome specifically may provide evidence of uh, changes in terms of the health status of these individuals. In this study, what you can see as well is that um, so this is also preliminary data because the, the, the idea of this study as well is to see whether we can essentially try and understand how individuals in informal housing um, might be subject to growth stunting as a result of all of the different environmental variables that might impede their development. The, the, the rates of stunting, uh, as some of you might know, have increased in South Africa over the past 10 years. So what we tried to do as part of this study, we looked at differences in the, um, the proportion of, of bacteria in individuals that have been characterized as stunted and not stunted. So what you can see in these uh, colorful plots again is that you can see very clear differences in terms of the abundance of certain bacteria that are present in stunted and non-stunted individuals. And these uh, numbers in terms of the alpha diversity, which is just the counts um, of diversity, is you see higher alpha diversity in non-stunted individuals um, versus stunted children. Again, if you have increased numbers of diversity, it again translates to improved resilience in the gut microbiota. One of the things that we'd like to do as part of this study is study how is investigate how the metabolic genes associated with stunted and non-stunted individuals might differ and how that impacts on the overall effects of the growth of these individuals that are, are, are moved from informal to formal housing. We currently, with Cheryl and a bunch of other people, putting together a large grant that will start to test um, functional related uh, questions in terms of its or in terms of the effect of the microbiome and how it might help us understand the economic importance of moving people from um, uh, environments that may not be optimal in terms of their health, using the microbiome as a proxy for good health. So a key uh, thing from this study as well, which links to some of the results from the first study, is that when we looked at the taxonomic analysis, again, the individuals in um, uh, these sites also don't uh, follow a westernized centric healthy unhealthy axis, right? We see a high proportion of potentially novel taxa in individuals who demonstrate stunting and those who don't demonstrate stunting. And this proportion of uh, high um, undescribed taxa may potentially have implications in terms of their capacity of the gut fauna to digest certain metabolites or not digest certain metabolites, which may lead to adverse health outcomes. So as I said, we in the process now of uh, expanding the research that we've done in these individuals to try and uh, specifically test questions related to whether there are differences in key short chain fatty acids and other metabolic genes in these individuals and what implication that has on their health outcomes. So in summary, when you look at the three case studies that I've mentioned, what you start to see is that our studies contribute towards understanding the relationship between host factors, the environment, and microbial communities in shaping the gut microbiota, um, diversity, and function in African individuals. 
the studies that we've initiated um, also clearly show that compared to uh, individuals in the global north, you see a higher proportion of yet undescribed gut fauna. And these gut fauna potentially have implications in terms of the function and the metabolic processes of, of uh, the capacity of these microbes to digest certain metabolites in these individuals. Moreover, this high diversity of undescribed taxa may also potentially hold um, uh, uh, the potential for as yet untapped probiotics, which may be present within the gut microbiota of these individuals. With that, I'll sort of thank all of the individuals that have uh, contributed in terms of designing the studies that we've been able to leverage for some of our microbiome studies. Uh, Teresa Rousseau, who assisted us uh, as part of the Siakula trial to get access to the individuals uh, linked to the HIV study, uh, focused on growth stunting. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Ronald Berger and, and Lauren, who um, also um, asked us to join their study that's looking at housing um, uh, in South Africa. And we hope to expand these efforts because by being um, given the opportunity to undertake these studies, we can directly show the translatability of microbiome studies so that it it it, it becomes quite clear um, also to policy make, makers and people that um, uh, fund some of our studies that by looking at, for instance, obscure patterns in terms of the uh, stability of gut fauna is that this actually has long-term effects when you're looking at the health status of these individuals. With that, I'll bring my talk to a close and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for listening. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's just take questions. Yeah, I think it's monitoring online. Cheryl, let's second. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Thank you for your um, talk. Um, I wanted to know the cases of the rural versus urban How much is speculated that related to diet versus access to antibiotics? Yeah, so, so the, the question is for our rural study. Um, and it's linked specifically to the key findings that we found about differences in and in the in the abundance of antibiotics and antibi antimicrobial resistance genes in urban and rural populations. And you are asking me to speculate regarding what could be driving these differences. So when we um, looked at as part of this study, we also took a range of different um, measurements in terms of the survey, where we asked people specifically, what do they eat? Um, and as part of the criteria for inclusion, we specifically asked people that, uh, we excluded people who were on antibiotics in the last six months. Um, and for the taxonomy um, related uh, analysis with the, the bacterial data set, we could see, for instance, that diet and geography were key drivers in terms of shaping the gut microbiota, right? So you see very clear distinction between the gut microbiota of people from urban locations and those from rural locations. Of course, in terms of uh, the antimicrobial resistance, you can uh, still speculate that although we tried to sort of standardize uh, use of antibiotics, there might be a higher proportion of antibiotic usage in urban populations compared to rural populations. And one of the other things I should say is that, you know, 
in these studies where we always try and uh, sort of separate people from urban and rural, we also don't take into consideration that there's a lot of uh, transition um, between the two states. So people in rural areas might go to urban locations uh, for, you know, to clinics or also to buy food, right? Uh, although they might live most of the time in rural locations, there is a lot of interactions. But what you do clearly see from at least the gut diversity studies is that uh, the effect of diet is quite strong in rural populations. And we know that they rely a lot more on dietary diets that are rich in fiber compared to individuals in the urban setting. So that seems to be one of the key things that drive this difference is uh, over-reliance on diets that have high fiber compared to more carbohydrate-rich diets in urban populations. Oh, yep, you can ask all the questions. Okay, so just to recap your question for the online people, your question was um, that you know that using antibiotics can lead to reduced diversity in the gut microbiota. And you wanted to um, uh, sort of uh, see whether this could lead to the difference that we observed in the abundance of uh, um, uh, taxa which harbor antibiotics in urban populations versus rural populations. Okay, all right, more specifically, whether the high diversity um, leads to increased resilience. So that's actually what we, we find in this study. So for, for the network analysis that I showed, you are essentially testing um, predicted interactions between uh, gut microbiota, and what you can see from that analysis is that when you look at the interactions, you see a lot more nodes, and that's more interactions in the rural population compared to the urban population, right? So the increased nodes also seem to center around key uh, microbes within the gut fauna of rural populations that appear to be the equivalents of keystone taxa that mediate a lot of the interactions in the gut, right? So in other words, you're, you're completely correct, right? There are high um, diversity in the rural populations translates to increased interactions. So these microbes cooperate more and they, you know, there might be a sharing of key metabolites, for instance, uh, that are provided. And this leads to a higher uh, resilience because they're much more able to withstand a pathogen that might attack because, um, because of this increased interactions within the gut form. And you don't have that in the urban populations where the interactions are a lot more sporadic. You, you said you had lots of questions. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was waiting for someone to say it. It's also perspective, moving it forward. Yeah, that's, that's a, a disclaim I, I stated when I was also answering her. Just to recall the question for the online um, uh, people, you heavily complimented my fish and you want to know how we ensure that there is no transition between urban and rural populations. And the answer is that we can't, right? Because people move around um, and you can, we, we sort of try to ask whether they've uh, been uh, to, 
you know, so we, we try to get around that by um, looking at the type of food that they eat and trying to measure the proportion to which they uh, rely on food that they've grown in their own gardens uh, versus food that they get from you know, shop right or wherever, right? And from that, you can see that compared to people in rural areas, right? Although we can't say that they're not moving, there's definitely some transition, but these are people that spend the majority of their time in rural locations and their diets uh, differ quite markedly compared to people in urban localities. So, uh, and we could uh, quantify the proportion to which diet explains the differences between the two settings. But of course, I mean, you're correct, there is always transition uh, between these individuals and you can't negate the effects of moving from one location to another. That can also, that can also explain some of the variation, but it's quite difficult to constrain that in a statistical framework to quantify the extent to which that uh, transition uh, explains the differences that you observe. The, the compounding factors like individuals with the long term medi medication, mm -hmm. uh, whether they were included or excluded or a subset or kind of class analysis. Yeah. You know their home types. Yeah. So for the online people, again, he started off by complimenting my fish. Um, and then he asked how we exclude the use of medication long term, because that could explain the differences in the gut microbiota. As part of the, the, the I guess you referring to the first case, case study, we specifically only targeted healthy individuals. That's people that were not on any medication. And we targeted individuals from 18 I think to about 25 as part of the people that we included in the study. So these are people that self-reported as being healthy. They were not on any kind of long-term treatment and they were not using any antibiotics as well. So, so that we could exclude as part of the study. But of course, when you look at, you know, the, you know, in, in the second case study of HIV uh, exposed individuals, of course, there will be use of antiretroviral treatments and then of course, will have uh, certain impacts on the gut microbiota. And in turn, the microbes in the gut will also have an interaction with some of those chemical compounds that are used in the treatment of HIV. So there is a direct relationship. They are probably being transported from the back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but then we also talked about for TB, right? Which means like uh, probably if you have violent serum or you do not, it's in face, your T cell functions and exposed to the acid, you know, TB. So we basically, do you have any plans to sort of check, like in your studies, to check these sort of acids where they are ending up? And I know like 90% of them are using. The guard to produce energy, mm -hmm. but some that really that, that the, the guard to the lands, where they put the rain. Do you have any intention of maybe getting like a single department to sort of try to figure out whether these are who's any problem? Like, for example, in South Africa, the is a big problem. Mm -hmm. It's great to know that we kept up, which is a big problem. Yeah. And complement treatment by having to figure out how to do the trade that's. Yeah, so just so to recap, your question is on whether we have any plans to um, look at where some of the metabolites that may be produced in our guts actually end up, right? Hopefully in a sewage would be a good start, but we do have studies where we are looking at um, uh, monitoring a sewage treatment plans and also whether the 
types of plants we have are actually effective in reducing the spread of, uh, in JP's case, ARGs um, into freshwater systems. Because what you do see is that although some of these uh, systems may be quite effective in terms of reducing fecal coliform and total coliforms, is that they are, are quite ineffective in reducing certain other bacteria that may be present within that system that could lead to other problems. So butyrate is one, and you've listed some of the problems that it uh, can be associated with. Antimicrobial resistance is one that we've looked a bit more closely in terms of how there is essentially a connectivity between the environment, the gut, and where it actually ends up. But yes, so we are undertaking similar studies to try and because, of course, all of us live in an environment, right? Uh, and that's one of the nice things I like about the study that looks at individuals in the formal and informal housing. That study actually looks at a range of different measures, including the toxicology, uh, air quality, and also tries to understand what effect that has on us, but in turn, what effect we have on altering the environment because we definitely have an environment, an environmental effect in terms of um, the effects that we render very negatively in terms of altering ecosystem services. I hope that answers. One more, please. Lots of questions online. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So again, the gentleman spent a long time complimenting my fish, uh, but he did ask one short question, uh, two actually. Um, the first is whether we looked at the mode of birth uh, in the study that looked at HIV exposed individuals, and we did. So we, we did look at whether um, the mode of birth was by cesarean or natural, because of course that has a direct impact in terms of seeding the gut microbiota. And that's one of the measurements that we took uh, as part of that study. And then the second question, remind me again. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of hygiene, I mean, that's quite difficult to, to measure, but in the study, um, that looks at people that move from formal and informal housing. Um, the, the researchers uh, that are part of the study have looked at using dish cloths as a proxy, as a proxy for uh, measuring the hygiene levels, because obviously the dish, dish cloth gets used around the house, hopefully in the kitchen, um, and the reservoir of bacteria that uh, may be contained in the dish cloth can give you a good, um, uh, a quality, well, a good, a good way of measuring the hygiene status in that home, right? And the idea is that you can use that as a proxy both in the informal housing and the formal housing. And what you should see is that you see uh, less um, uh, bacteria, for instance, that may be classified as pathogens uh, with that transition. So it is one of the measures that I looked at as part of that study. Yeah. So the first is just a comment from Joanne saying brilliant presentation, exciting to see the, this consolidation of expertise across Africa on behalf of the investigators at UCT and IDM. We would be very keen to join forces and add expertise where we can. And I'm sure Joanne also appreciates your fish. <laughs> so. I don't know. She didn't specifically say it. <laughs> And I only want people to say it. Okay, the next question is, um, it says, hey, everyone. Um, outstanding presentation, Prof Tilani. What is the contribution of the study of the gut microbiota to One Health concept? Yeah, so that's related, I think, in part to uh, the question that was asked in the back, um, is that we, 
our central thesis is that microbes obviously underpin any efforts to look at one health because uh, they are, you know, uh, present in terms of in controlling plant interactions. They're present within our guts and they play a key role, for instance, in plant uh, or, or animal related interactions, including the use of antibiotics. So in all the studies that we look at, I gave in terms of the example of the ARG and environmental monitoring, we always take a systematic view, uh, not only looking at the effect of microbes within the individuals, but trying to look at it long term in terms of its ultimate effect on the ecosystem around us. So this directly contributes to the, the efforts to sort of uh, um, understand microbial contributions to one health. Thank you. And the next question is um, about your study on the stunted versus no stunted study. And the question is because diet, microbiome and immune system is interrelated, where do you draw the line between each of these when analyzing data in an attempt to determine the initiator for stunted growth? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so drawing the line is going to be tough. But um, the only tools we have is trying to constrain it to a statistical framework. So you can use, for instance, structural equation models to try and quantify the proportional effect of each of those variables. Uh, and that might give you some measure of trying to understand, for instance, the proportion to which the gut microbiota uh, contribute towards the differences linked to stunting. So, um, I mean, short, short of uh, trying to use statistics and measuring as many variables as you can, um, I wouldn't know how to uh, uh, kind of draw that line, but this is sort of what we um, think would be the best way to kind of measure the proportion or contribution of gut fauna. Okay, we have another question from Lynn about your stunting versus not stunting. So her question is, what are the age group of the kids? If breastfeeding age still, do you consider the impact of breastfeeding or no breastfeeding and the period of time kids in the study remain best breastfed and importantly, the genetics of the breastfeeding mothers? Yeah, so for this um, sample, give us remind me, but I think these were infants uh, less than 10 months. Um, that were part of the study, and we did look at uh, whether they were being breastfed. And you, you do see in the gut microbiota uh, a high proportion of uh, uh, taxa that are, are linked to breast milk. Um, and in fact, they seem to outnumber what you would expect in terms of the the composition of the gut fauna, because typically you'd see firmicutes and bacterial data that are in, present in high proportion. But in some of these, we see more actinobacteria and other lineages, which is uh, which are actually good for you, that are present at proportionally higher abundances in the gut fauna. Thanks. We have a question from Joanne. She wants to know what are your thoughts on host genetics on the gut microbiome? So. Is it all environment and diet, or does host genetics play a role? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think without having quantified it, I suspect host genetics plays a very important role, and that's actually what would like um, to do a lot more of. Um, the only issue is that uh, well, I, I guess you can. Um, uh, specifically measure genetic diversity and try and relate it to the gut uh, 